Bienvenidos. Um, good evening. So it's a great pleasure to be here. Um, uh, before, uh, before I begin, I just want to uh, express how happy I am to see such a full room, but also to all of those who could not come into the room, the foundation is aware and hope that you can um, participate via, via screening. But in the future, we'll try to accommodate a larger uh, a venue with, uh, that accommodates a larger audience. So um, my name is Luis Bettencourt. I'll be your moderator uh, tonight. Uh, I'm a professor uh, at the University of Chicago. And my work is about uh, urban science and practice. Um, the format tonight will be um, Five presentations followed uh, the first three, and then we'll uh, pause for the real part of it, which is the debate. So we'll have some questions and answers with the speakers, and then we'll do that again with the last two speakers. Um, before we start with that, um, I wanted to, um, to thank um, a few parties and a few people that are essential uh, for all this to be possible. So first of all, um, I want uh, to uh, thank the Norman Foster Foundation, who organizes the event in partnership with Rolex. Um, then I want to thank uh, the team at the Norman Foster Foundation for organizing all this. So I, I'm asking you for a round of applause. They worked very hard for it. And uh, last but not least, I really want uh, to um, thank Elena and Norman Foster for their vision, their generosity, and really their genius that makes all of this possible. So thank you. It's a special day today. <laughs> Wonderful. Thank you. Um, so uh, today's public debate is about sustainability, right? And sustainability is something that in some sense has many meanings. It's meant to have many meanings. But uh, some of the meanings that it definitely shares, whatever context you, you're working in, have to do with long-term thinking, with uh, really integrating a lot of the implications of what we do, um, and therefore the integration of how we act in the world. In this case, we'll be talking a lot, of course, about architecture and urban design, uh, how we integrate mostly features of the built environment and how we make it run with social and ecological processes. And in many ways, cities have been, uh, have been thought of, but also have been uh, in almost competition and with a negative relationship with these environments. And sustainability thinking uh, and doing really asks that we think about, we reconceptualize, learn new ways of working that allow us to create a more positive or a truly positive relationship. And you'll see many examples of that today in terms of interactions uh, between the built environment and aspects of cities, particularly the first part, which will be more at the city scale. And then the second part will be, um, in some sense, how we think about uh, buildings differently, how we use new technologies to really create those positive interactions. So without a lot of further ado, uh, I'll start with a format, which, uh, which will take me speak a little bit about my resident city, my city of Chicago, where I live. Um, let's see if the slides come up. And, uh, and I'll give you uh, a sense of some of these interventions. And uh, in, in saying all this before I get into it, I want you to be thinking, I see most of you in the room are young, and so you have your careers ahead of you. And uh, I want you to think in this way, in this sustainability way, uh, about you know, all the things, what we want to do today is really inspire your imagination, your passion to uh, discover some of these solutions. So part of my point is that these, a lot of these solutions, a lot of these approaches are to be invented, and we're inventing them now. It will be a big part of your life. OK, so with that said, let me show you, start firing up a little bit of your imagination, hopefully, with some examples from the city of Chicago. And then you'll hear from other cities. So today we'll, we'll hear from Chicago in the first part. You'll also hear about Singapore and about Vienna. Good. So this is where I live. It's, uh, it's kind of a, a big, mean American city. It's really muscular and big and has all these big buildings. It's quite extraordinary. This river was once actually reversed. So such was the feat of engineering. And one of the things you see is that the city has been elevated. At some point, the whole of Chicago was elevated six feet because they needed, when they discovered, and definitely at some point decided to put sewage systems and other systems below it. So one of the things I want you to always keep in mind is that we've done extraordinary interventions in almost every city, including Madrid, and that this is, we have to think ambitiously in long term. 
So but what I wanted to tell you about today, just a few points just to orient ourselves. Um, so I want to give you a couple examples from Chicago. I'll tell you about a very famous park in Chicago. If you've visited, you've been there. Uh, but also how aspects of the built environment in a dense city can be transformed to really create a completely different environment. And the general lessons, though, run through some of what I say, but also the rest of, of the session, is that sustainability really derives at a city scale about how a city is built and what, how it's built has a lot to do with how it works. So you can say that backwards or, or front, as I just did. And we don't really know how to do this. We're discovering how cities actually work in these, in these beneficial ways for people and the environment. And this requires a close interaction between a certain intellectual ambition, policy, and practice. So here are some pictures, right? Uh, so this is a very famous icon. It's maybe the icon of Chicago. It's Anish Kapoor uh, cloud gate and kind of reflects the city, but it's in a public space in a park. And that park uh, also has this famous fountain by uh, a Spanish artist, so I thought I'd put it in, uh, Jaume Panza. Uh, so these are really some of the most extraordinary uh, public spaces, and everyone that comes to Chicago comes to see them. Um, and they're really pl places, Chicago is a very segregated city, there are places of inclusion, a lot of people come together in these spaces, children play, it's really kind of a different vibe that's being created by this kind of environment. And uh, you know, it's famous for its Pritzker Pavilion, which is the Gary design and so on. This park, uh, you'll, I'll reveal the secret in a moment, but can only have buildings that are either art or architecture. It cannot have any plain building. Okay, and this is because it's actually public land and this is what's underneath it. So once upon a time, Chicago, of course, always was a very industrial city, but there was a huge train depot and a big parking lot. And at some point, uh, legend has it that the mayor went to the dentist in one of those tall buildings and looked down and was dismayed and decided, you know, how can we transform this? And so the idea is that it turns out that one of the cheaper ways to transform it is to turn it into a park, cover it and turn it into a park. So that's what you were seeing today. Is a, so this is a space that excludes, that's polluting and so on, and you create a complete opposite in terms of sustaining life. So this is kind of very uh, important and interesting. The other example I want to tell you a little bit about, this is City Hall in Chicago. And Chicago's become famous in the last maybe 15 years for its green roofs. So you saw all these tall buildings. But what's interesting is that if you see them from the top, go to the Google Earth, you can see it. You'll see that the city is actually quite green in many of these buildings and has these wonderful recreational spaces uh, on top. So I just want to show you a little bit. You see sort of a map of all the green roofs in Chicago there to the, to the left. And you know, here are four examples of them. Many of these are institutional buildings that are city hall or bigger hospitals, but some are also private, like that building in West Elm. So uh, it's kind of interesting. It's a new technology about how to put these green roofs on top of buildings. They cannot be very deep in terms of soil, so there are certain plants you can use. But they're really wonderful to create these meadows, and these meadows create a whole ecology that have to do with pollinators and birds and a bunch of other things that now exist sort of at the, at, in the sky over the city. So it's really something wonderful. At the same time, uh, you know, there's a lot of engineering that goes with this. Uh, uh, these soils capture water, do different water management at the building level, and also cool down the building and can save you a lot of uh, uh, energy from ventilation and so on. So these are sort of some of the examples uh, that I wanted to start with. And in some sense, you, can, you could kind of see it here, but I, we, we now have information about all the built environment of cities almost in the world. So uh, you can start imagining that this whole ecology of cities is not only old and works with nature in the old sustainable way, but also does new things. It creates new ecologies, new possibilities, and so on. So I live there, which is very dense, but we have a few interesting ones. But the thing I want to leave you with, and the first thing I came uh, to discuss with Norman and the foundation was that a lot of the built environments of the world are being built. So this is exactly the same kind of technology creating uh, the built environment of the rest of the world. Some of this, this is outside Cape Town. So there's a lot of imagination and redesign that is necessary and it will become um, essential for sustainability. So sustainability again derives from how a city works and how it works, how it can work depends on how it's built. So this is sort of a, a lot of your job in the audience is to think about that. But there's a world of new possibilities and new design remits that are essential. So we don't know how to do this, but we're discovering how to do it. But all of it requires this greater integration with ecosystems and social systems. And it requires of the architect and the designer new skills and new knowledge 
And so part of the theme for the talks that are to come uh, are really about, uh, about that and how uh, the profession can do that better and all the discoveries and exciting things ahead. So thank you, and I'll pass it on to Nirmal, who will be the next speaker. Well, thank you, Louis. Um, uh, many thanks to the foundation, Lord and Lady Foster, for the invitation to be here. Uh, I'm going to start with something of a critique, um, which is that a green building today. Is it working? Oh, well. Green building today um, is seen largely as an optimization of parts. Now, we seek um, efficiency of air conditioning, heating, ventilation, lighting, envelope systems, etc. A green city, by extension of that definition, is an aggregate outcome of many optimized high-performing buildings. This is, of course, a fallacy. Um, the problem of segregation of parts versus the whole. What if instead of subdividing holes into parts, we reimagine holes? What if we start uh, with intelligent form making at the building scale? How would that alter the city? Here are four projects in Singapore um, with forms that create room for social and ecological systems and seek connectivity between the building and the urban scales. I will illustrate this idea uh, with the Kutek Pot Hospital, the fourth at the bottom. Kutek Pot Hospital uh, is one of 10 acute care hospitals in Singapore. Um, it was completed in 2010 uh, on a site that is situated in northeast Singapore in a public housing estate. So if I was talking to an audience of architects, I might present the hospital in this way uh, as a uh, cluster of building blocks. I would describe, for instance, uh, the uh, programming, the footprint, capacities, etc. But today, um, this is how I'd like to talk about the hospital, as the network of spaces in between. Blue, green, and social systems that come together to form thriving socio-ecological spaces. Key to this outcome is the form of the building and strategic use of shape and space, porosity and adjacency. The three blocks here form a central court uh, that opens up to a public promenade and, what, uh, and a, pub, a water body. Now, in the context of Singapore hospitals, this was radical. No hospital in Singapore up to that point had engaged with the neighborhood in quite this way. So I'll start with the greenery, um, perhaps the most visible element of the development. The sum of all greenery in the hospital is six times the total plot site area. Uh, this is what we refer to in Singapore as the green plot ratio. Yeah. Uh, the forested court, which you see in this picture, is two to three degrees cooler than the neighborhood on a warm day. This space is publicly accessible 24-7. Um, not surprisingly then, 15% of all visitors to the hospital do not come for health-related reasons. They come to socialize and to relax. Um, and they come for this. Uh, the choice and the placement of water and plants creates an impression of being immersed in wild nature, uh, a biophilic experience to the max. The standing joke I tell my students is that this is the only hospital in Singapore where, upon arrival, your blood pressure goes down. <laughs> um, part of the, building is, uh, of the building envelope is also a social space. The roof of the outpatient specialist clinics block is, uh, produces food. Volunteers from the neighborhood uh, tend to vegetable gardens. Produce from this farm is sold on hospital grounds, and adjacent to the farm is a canopy of photovoltaic panels. But while energy and food production on site is relatively modest, uh, the on-site capture of water is significant. Within the court are ponds and streams. Uh, below are tanks that store rainwater. Combined, this system offsets 18% of the building's total water demand. The hospital has a two-way exchange with Yishun Pond, the, the image on the left, which is a large water body that sits on an adjacent parcel. I think that this pond and its transformation was the biggest breakthrough of the hospital. 
Now, the hospital's development triggered its change. Um, never mind that it doesn't actually belong to the hospital or that it has nothing to do with healthcare. During construction, the hospital management engaged with, um, in a dialogue with several government agencies and persuaded them to share the cost of turning this pond from a concrete edged uh, stormwater tank into a public park with floating wetlands. Together, the hospital and the pond attracts residents who live and work nearby, but it is also a biodiversity hotspot amidst larger hotspots in that part of Singapore. This is a nature way uh, that links the project to the Central Catchment Nature Reserve. Um, a nature way, by the way, in Singapore is a street where the tree canopies are connected in a way that allows for the movement of animals uh, between different parts of Singapore. Now these are actual images of uh, birds, insects that were sighted on the hospital grounds. There is documentation literally of hundreds of um, fish, birds and insects that have been sighted and recorded. Now it may be impossible to predict accurately which species will come to any development, but there are now tools that, make, that allow us to model other aspects of ecological performance. This graph shows what's referred to as ecosystem services, such as air temperature regulation and carbon storage, of four densely vegetated buildings in Singapore. Now, each is benchmarked against a pristine forest habitat of equivalent size, uh, represented by the 100% mark. Here is where Kutek Puat, uh, excluding Yishun Pond, fits in. Uh, the numbers may look modest uh, today, but I think this analysis and this chart is remarkable for two reasons. First, we have a tool that lets a project team gauge ecosystem services at the drawing board. Second, these buildings on average hit 10, 15 to 25% across indicators. Now, conventional buildings, by the way, would rarely cross the 5% mark. Now imagine if we set targets for future buildings that is at, say, three to four times higher than what Kutek Pot Hospital does. Might a city that is made up of these buildings begin to mimic a rainforest? One could argue, of course, that these outcomes cannot be fully planned or anticipated. So much, hap so much that happens on these sites is nonlinear emergence. But tools like this will add bite to our intuitions, and they will help us evaluate form intelligence for anything that is yet to be built. Thank you. So from the only hospital that I would ever want to go to, um, to a city where we all live because we want to and not because we have to. Now, in the next couple of minutes, I will be taking you to Vienna. And just as an intro, imagine the world's most livable city with high quality, affordable housing at the heart of new developments, a green and blue city with thriving local centers connected with green boulevards where you love walking, taking long walks to explore it for hours and hours, and then welcome to Vienna. At the heart of Vienna's approach to sustainability stand three notions, affordability, livability, and community. And I think that it is the combination of the three that makes Vienna to what it is today. Now let me start also very quickly by defining livability as we understand it. We want to be a city that's good for children because we're deeply convinced that a city that's good for children is good for us all. It's good for every generation. We want our children to grow up in a healthy and safe environment. We want them to have access to nature. We want them to be able to move around freely and play. We want them to be able to play with water. All these things are things that we love for ourselves as well, and we believe that they should be at the heart of design. This said, 
This, by the way, is a new urban quarter and the backdrop is social housing and the lake that you see is artificial. A city that's good for children is good for us all. That means we have to do it in new urban quarters, but we have to do it when transforming the already built city as well. Now, how do we do it? Chapter one. I'll see if, we'll see if I make it to chapter two today. <laughs> chapter one, 100 years of public housing tradition. And here you see actually a historical, very emblematic building of public housing. Mind you, these were actually pieces of city. So it was not just about housing. They had libraries, they had schools, they had kindergartens. They had vast green inner yards. They had swimming pools back in the 1920s. And this is what it is today. And it is actually a story, a history, 100 years of history of social entrepreneurship. Why am I saying this? This is a point I'd like to make. 62% of the Viennese population already live either in public, municipally owned housing or in subsidized social housing. Very high quality. And it's the result of a collaboration of over 50 non-profit housing corporations. So housing developers in Vienna alone. It's approximately 180 in Austria. So it really is a story of social entrepreneurship and at the heart of it are non-profit developers. You can see that it is high quality. So the city aims at 7,000 additional units to be created every year. And they have to win competitions against each other, the developers. The criteria are that they need to be diverse in architecture. They need to be, and also high quality architecture, they need to be ecologically innovative, they need to be cost efficient, and they need to be socially inclusive. It's targeting middle class, so it has no stigma. You can see here the entry limits. I mean, it's well beyond 100,000 net annual income for a family of four. So 75% of the Viennese population actually qualify for social housing. And the city is at the same time a green and blue city. 53% of the overall area is green spaces, but we plan to expand this. And the way we're doing it is by creating a network of green, blue and open spaces aiming at having everybody being able to enter it within 300 meters from any specific spot within the city and then being able to walk in every direction always being in a green space. So imagine green spaces connected of course via linear green connections. Now we use every new, every, every single new development as an opportunity for additional green. Here you can see how this is being done. And at the heart of every new development, we have vast, accessible, open green spaces, 24-7 um, accessible, and of course open to everybody in the entire area, not just the people that will be living there. We always introduce spaces for community action, example given here, community farming in new urban quarters. We take the cars out, so we do low car ownership in urban quarters, and the money that we save from garages that we do not need to build, we give back to the people, example given as swimming pools on the rooftop. And the newest development here is that we have collaborative housing projects. These are projects that are being developed by the tenants themselves. So here's another example of it. And that takes me to the second part, chapter two, and that is if we use every new development as an opportunity for improvement, for repair, for making the city more sustainable, how do we transform the already built city? Now the heart of it is a polycentric approach where we say every neighborhood needs a heart, a heart that's beating. It needs a center. It needs a place where people go because they want to and not because they have to. So, the way we do it is 
we decided we want to be a city that's made for walking. There is a network of pedestrian boulevards to take you across the city that connects parks and institutions and universities and schools and whatnot and can take you for hours and hours across the city. But at the heart of everything is rethinking the street. Wherever possible and as often as possible. And we do it following the so-called 1000 needle strategy. And now I will flip you very quickly through some of the needles. Making room for public space very often means taking cars out. We all know that urban space is a limited edition. So traffic calming one or the other way. There are several ways to go about it. It need not always be pedestrianization. It can be shared space. It can be, in any case, redesigning to gain space for, plane make, for place making. And here's an example of our longest shopping street, the way it looked back in 2010. This is what it looks like today. But that's an emblematic thing that you can find in every city, right? Practically every city will have a pedestrian zone somewhere. The magic about it is that it now kind of expands in the adjoining streets. Here is an example of such a transformation. Here's another one. It's a terrace over the metro. So making space. Here is the map of how we want to mitigate heat islands, so places in the city that are very hot in the summer. And you can see that it has needles everywhere. So it might be tiny interventions, but it is the connection between all of them that makes the difference in transforming the entire city. And here now you can see how this is being done in each and every neighborhood. It can be a shading construction, it can be a zero depth fountain in front of the metro station. We have actually not only children playing with water. I was there too. So there is a photo of me in there. We have temporary cool streets in the summer that will be then turned into permanent because you don't have the money to do that simultaneously all over the city at the same time. Here's just numerous examples of what happened in the last two summers. So take a spot, a small spot, and transform it every summer because this is basically the time of the year when we do things. And then embrace community action, and that's the last part. That is where we actually not only do things ourselves as a city, but where it becomes immensely important that you provide schemes for community action, where you can support community action, where you can actually financially support it, but in many cases legally support it. You, you have to encourage it and you have to organize it. Now Vienna has urban renewal offices that are operating in every neighborhood, supporting local transformation processes and creating and supporting local ecosystems. And here you can see again some of the projects spreading throughout the city. This is in front of schools because we have found out that these are very often focal points and you need to start transformation in front of schools, creating places. And last but not least, we have a community grant scheme of 4,000 euro that anybody can have to do whatever they want in their neighborhood as long as it provides a beautiful free space for everybody to be able to use without having to pay entrance and without having to consume. And look what they're doing with it. That, by the way, was um, a farm for two years at the premises of an old factory that is now actually a new social housing urban quarter. And that is actually what I would like to share with you. In the end, if I had to put it down into two main points to be shared, I would say, number one, innovation comes from the ecosystem. So you need to create, develop, and foster an ecosystem and collaborate with them to produce innovative results. But transformation, wide-scale transformation, transforming the face of an entire city, that comes from networks and distribution. That means collaborating with practically 
everybody, activating the entire wisdom of your city and working together with local communities to transform a place. This is actually, in a nutshell, what Vienna has been doing for 100 years. And if you ask me, this lies at the heart in terms of open governance of why Vienna is today and since 2010, every year in a row, the world's most livable city. And thank you. Okay, so now we're going to ask the hard questions. <laughs> um, so I, I think the first thing to reflect, I mean, wow, right? Extraordinary what can be done, what is being done, what was done in both, both, both cities, both cases, and how systematic it is, right? At the same time, I want to start with you, both your cities are exceptional. They're cities that have a long tradition of arriving at this kind of holistic design in the public interest. Uh, you know, as you said, uh, in Vienna for 100 years and in Singapore for since independence of 50 years. So my first question is how do you get there? How does it start? And one of the things that certainly if I put my hat on from Chicago and sort of think about more private enterprise versus public is that a lot of the costs can be private, but a lot of the benefits are really for the city, for, for its public life, for general benefit. So it's kind of there's sort of a problem of how to get there from, from, um, from the beginning for cities that don't have strong public sector, strong funding, and so on. So can you tell us a little bit what are sort of the pitfalls or how do you get there if you start in a different city? Well, there was something that you mentioned in your presentation, and that was that the mayor was at the dentist, right, mm -hmm. and looked down and said, this is an awful place. I think, to be honest, it has to start with leadership. Let's start with that. So you need, most of the times, a mayor that takes a decision. And in Vienna, it was in the 1920s, the decision by the mayor back then and the government in the face of a tremendous housing crisis, actually homelessness crisis, that they wanted to embark in the world's biggest housing program to date. And the vision was that it is not just about housing, it is about places that will foster the creation of the new working class. So it was all about quality and let's say an idea of city. Now once you do that, the next thing you have to know is that you have to deal with controversy and conflict. And I think that we always talk about collaboration and cooperation, and that's right, but that disguises what it is about. It's about negotiating and finding a way Okay, to bring different interests together. And that means that you will need to focus on your allies, I think. I think the pitfall in many cases is that we focus on our enemies and spend time <laughs> fighting them and forget about our allies. So we need to create ecosystems together with our allies who are willing to move in the same direction. And then you have to find the money. <laughs> And in the case of Vienna, the money was found by introducing a new tax on the one hand, which is one, it exists until today, it's 1% on the income of all employees, and it is dedicated to social housing. <coughs> so it's practically nothing for the individual, but for the common good, it's a wow. And the second thing I think you need to do, but that gets then very specific, and I'll leave it at that when it comes to social housing, or let's say to affordable housing is, you need actually an active land policy. And no, let me correct myself, I think you always need an active land policy. So if we think of cities, we should always start by thinking of the land. Who owns the land? Who has access to the land? Who has control over what happens on the land? And a city, I think, always needs to focus on its land policy. And Vienna has also 100 years of tradition, but your question was, how did it all start? Well, it all started with the First World War and the end of monarchy in Austria, which meant that you had all these people from, you know, royal family, etc., who owned vast expanses of land, and the city introduced taxation on property. So it had, first of all, the taxes 
on the income of employees and then the taxation of, of property and it used the money to buy off the land and build vast land reserves. So this is just a story, if, 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 if you will, but I think that it is a story that shows that you need to have a vision, you need to have a plan, it needs to be a long-term plan, you need an ecosystem. And again, always think, this is the one thing I want to share with the world, please take care of your allies, love them, identify <laughs> them, okay? Spend time with them. Don't waste your time fighting your enemies. Right. But in some sense, 100 years ago, it also started in a moment of crisis, right? A moment of transition, a moment of crisis. And that's kind of interesting. And I think it has a little bit of parallel with Singapore uh, of the country that it was in 65 at independence, right? A, a very poor country with desperate need for housing and so on. So there was sort of a big impetus to do something quickly by the public sector. But you can tell us a little bit more sure, about yeah. how you get there. And also, I remember we we're talking about this a little bit at lunch that Singapore is not always designed this way, right? In the early days, it designed very functionally to solve immediate problems. Mm. And so a lot of this, as in Vienna, you know, the kind of design that was created originally was not as green and people friendly as it is today. So there's a whole, you know, process of learning, right? And, and improving and so on. So tell us a little bit about the, that from yeah. Singapore. No, I, um, I, I think the question of leadership is central. Um, to this, and it often comes down to a few people um, with vision. Um, Singapore is, of course, famous uh, for um, uh, for its leadership. Uh, back in the early days, uh, the Prime Minister of a city state, Lee Kuan Yew, uh, was instrumental in shaping the form and the shape of the city. But, but I, I think, unlike unlike Vienna, perhaps the question was less about quality and more about survival uh, in the early days. Uh, we were not expecting to be a city-state. <laughs> we were part of Malaya at one point, um, and uh, when we left Malaya, it was all but a foregone conclusion that Singapore would collapse. It had no natural resources. It had um, um, it had a lot of slums. It 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 was a city that didn't have um, uh, much hope of survival. Um, but at that point, the the argument for survival then translated into very specific instruments of policy. Um, the first was public housing. Um, now, public housing makes perfect sense uh, for many reasons, of course. Um, but in Singapore, I think the big question was how to uh, offer Singaporeans a stake in the country. Forget, don't forget we were a country of immigrants. Um, and so public housing was a way of giving every Singaporean ownership of a piece of Singapore as a way of creating um, a sense of statehood. 80% um, of Singapore is public housing. Um, we beat Vienna by, I think, 20-something uh, percent. Um, and, um, and that is a remarkable number for any city. 80% is public housing. Um, uh, and it is owned by the residents. It's not rented. Uh, they own it. So that was the first instrument of policy that, that was deemed necessary for survival. The second was how to attract uh, multinational corporations uh, to set up business in Singapore. And the, the premise here was that um, you can offer them tax incentives, et cetera, but there also had to be conditions of livability. Mm -hmm. So a lot of the things that we now frame as sustainability began really as necessity. Uh, environmental laws about pollution, cleaning the rivers, um, greening the city, which Singapore is famous for, uh, the amount of greenery. All of these were seen initially as an economic imp impetus of, of attracting companies to set up base in Singapore. Um, there were other instruments of policy, um, national service, which is the, the army, the conscription that all Singapore males have to, uh, to go through. Uh, education and so on. But I think the two things that changed the landscape were public housing and uh, public green spaces. I, I just want to add that uh, the shift in conversation from a quantitative to a quali qualitative approach has taken place in Singapore uh, in the last 40, 50 years. So today, we don't talk about the garden city anymore. We uh, now have progressed to talking about a city in nature. That's been an evolution of an idea, which goes to the argument that 
Um, the greenery in Singapore does more than uh, present a biophilic experience, that it is biocentric and that it promises to bring biodiversity to your doorstep. Uh, public housing likewise has gone through um, several mutations and today uh, there are discussions of how we bring the kampong spirit back. Now kampong is a word that refers to villages uh, uh, in Singapore. In, Mal in Malaysia it's a Malay word that speaks of village. The kampong spirit is what we had when we lived in villages. <laughs> Now that we live in high-rise uh, apartments, you know, uh, 25, 30 stories high, um, how do we bring that sense of neighborliness and social cohesion back? So there has been a big shift from uh, survival to livability. Mm -hmm. And I think a lot of experimentation, right, mm. these solutions and so on. So it's been a long path. So I think this problem of how do you start and how do you sustain it is kind of a problem that a lot of cities are really uh, ultimately you know, stuck on a little bit. So there's, there's really that question. But I think from both of what you said, it's sort of this importance of really thinking about the process of design or policy making in a very broad way and try to collect all the possible advantages and needs, right? You can think about very urgent needs that need to be addressed, but also how by doing that in a certain way, you can address long-term goals, right? So that's really important, right? I know Norman kind of thinks that way as a, you know, in his work in design. But it really is something that's not emphasized enough how important it is. So, so that's one thing. But I wanted to pick up on that because um, I think I know that many of you particularly uh, are very interested in architecture and may have a life in architecture and design. And I, I was reflecting as you were talking more from point of view of a policymaker, but you're an architect, about the role of, of the policymaker, the architect, or the designer in these processes particularly these more sustainable processes that we're emphasizing on. And it seems like, of course, there's a big, a big shift from the architect as the hero who's going to come in and design everything and present this, the great solution, right? Of course, this is old-fashioned, but you know, it's still with us when you open the books and so on. And it's, people like to feel that can be the hero, right? So I'm not discounting <laughs> it necessarily. But then a role in which you lose control, right? You, 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 you forego having control, right? And your role is more, almost like being a, ca a ca catalytic engine, right? To try to design for possibility, right? And for open-ended, hopefully, improvement, right? So I would like to hear a little bit, so that requires a different attitude, maybe a more, um, more generous, but more uncertain attitude. So do you want to tell me a bit about your experience? How is it to, when you are doing these things, you're no longer in control, right? You're trying for a good collective outcome. How do you do that best? I mean, in both your cultures of your cities, you do this very well. And you already alluded to some of it. But, but tell us more about that. Well, I think that one of the most fascinating uh, paradox, um, paradox, we would say, actually, great. Okay, is is actually that a city cannot be planned, right? It's never done and it can't be planned. So you're there as an urbanist and in some cases, example given as in my case as a vice mayor, and you would like to plan it, <laughs> but you can't. Right. So all you can do is to have a very clear idea, I think, of what kind of city you would like to live in and what kind of city you're trying to create for the people and then to let them do that. Now, our idea was to say, if we think of sustainability, if it's not affordable and it's not inclusive, it's non-sustainable. So it needs to be affordable and inclusive. If it's, if it's let, me, let me use this word, if it's ugly, <laughs> okay? If you can't walk anywhere, if there are no places where you would like to be, it's not sustainable. So it's not just about greening and introducing water elements and you know, introducing nature into the city, yes, of course, but it is also about realizing that it needs to be beautiful, it needs to be affordable, it needs to be collaborative, so it needs to be created together, and it needs again to be walkable and it needs to have places. And that takes you more or less straight to what actually the approach is. On the one hand, you need to work together with architects who, let me put it boldly, do not just obsess with the building, but realize that the building is actually part of the city. And this is why 
I loved Nirmal's work and his presentation. I, I was like, I was, I was amazed. I said, I want, I would like to have him in Vienna. Okay, <laughs> it's like, yes, because it's 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 like a piece of city. It's an it's 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 urban. So you need to work together with architects for that. And then, I think you need to realize Jane Jacobs quote, "The outside of the buildings is the inside of the city." So you need to focus into the qualities of public space. And as soon as you realize that, you have to engage in placemaking and make the city full of places where everybody wants to be. You're in the village. But the village, not in the sense, it needs to be an urban village, right? But it needs, you need to have a polycentric approach. You need to think about urban centers. You need to think about how to strengthen them, how to connect them with each other, and last but not least, how to do it in a way that introduces, reintroduces nature into the city, but at the same time engages the people. So in the end, let's make it very concrete. I mentioned before the, the community grant scheme that we introduced that is only 4,000 euro for literally anybody who has an idea. And everybody said in the beginning, it's going to end up in chaos and nobody's going to be caring for that. You see, you won't be able to spend the money. So in the first year, we had to double the budget, and then we had to triple it, and we've had <laughs> more than 500 such projects spreading throughout the entire city. So if you look at Vienna, how it is today, we would have never been able to plan it this way. But what counts is, that it has developed in the right direction. Mm -hmm. And this is why I'm saying you can never plan it, but you can actually lead the way, and then it happens. How does the architect feel about that? <laughs> you yeah, can never plan it. Uh, it's, it's, um, it's a conversation that I often have with my students, because I, I mean, I, I graduated in 1988. I'm giving away my age, aren't I? Um, uh, it, it was a very different world. Um, of practice. I mean, we um, would be given a project pretty much on a platter. <laughs> Here's the budget, and this is your time, and just get it done. You know, and the clients would step back, and um, and we were architects, we were interior designers, we were landscape architects. We did everything, um, and um, and that was expected. Today, I think um, the profession has changed dramatically, and. There is, to your point about control, a, a sense that we've lost control. Um, the process of making a building has gotten so complex. I think sustainability is the, another nail in the coffin, if you will, because it's, it's just so complex already, you know? Um, and, um, and, and so, very often, uh, the idea of integration and form making has become highly reductive. Uh, we, we tend to think of form making as uh, meeting programmatic needs, but also creating aesthetic objects or objects that meet budgets and so on. It, 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 it has become reductive. Um, I would argue, and I, 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 you know, t t what I say to my students is that, um, yes, it's got more complex, but then that just means that your role has evolved <coughs> from the idea of the hero architect, you know, um, s saving the day to someone that um, creates consensus, that creates momentum, that, that frames vision, and that drives the process uh, towards an outcome. The, the point I was making in my presentation about form intelligence is that we have to reclaim form. I think we've lost control of the idea of form. And I, you know, the, the green building movement hasn't helped. You know, we've, uh, we've been taught in the last 20 years by a green building movement that uh, the building is many parts and that if we just tweak all the parts, we somehow get a better whole. That's not true. We actually do have to visualize the whole and we have to reclaim this idea of form making. Form as not something that is an object in the landscape, but as a set of relationships, right? And here is where I think the complexity lies for architects. It is that of dealing with the unplanned. Um, I think, you know, you talked about the city not being uh, totally planned. It's not possible to totally plan a city. <laughs> um, the architect thinks the other way, right? We, we come in with this idea that it is concrete and steel and it's all these elements that are fixed. 
and um, tangible. Uh, and now suddenly we're talking about social systems and ecological systems that you know you could model up to a point, but beyond that, it it becomes it moves away from the formal towards being the informal. And I think this is the thing that um, I at least what I hope the teaching, the training of architects will impart is that your role has changed. You have not lost control, mm -hmm. um, but that you have to exercise a different kind of control. You have to be a different kind of a hero, if you will. <laughs> right. So I think you'll hear in the next two talks actually a sort of a greater focus on, on the building scale and how it plays out in interesting ways. And I think, I, I, I think we're going to come back to this question of what you control and what you don't control and what you can help create. I mean, one of the reflections that once blew my mind uh, had to do with something that came up with your slide on biodiversity, which is, but, uh, but I think there are many things in your examples too, is that when we actually allow this uh, openness to the city to create new kinds of life, both in nature and in society, you create not just things that you hope were there before, but new things. And that is actually amazing. So a lot of biodiversity studies, for example, show that there can be greater biodiversity in cities than in surrounding areas. And this is partly for the same reasons why people are there. It's that there are more resources, there's more variety of spaces, and this actually becomes a selective element that creates new opportunities. So uh, I think we're going to hear about the buildings now, and then we'll come back. And then if we have a little bit of time at the end, um, and if that's possible, I'll open up for a couple questions from the audience. Okay. So um, we'll leave the stage, and Lena uh, Gottme will be the next speaker. Thank you so much, Luis. Uh, such an inspiring uh, conversation and debate. Thank you so much for the foundation for this uh, event and for Elena and uh, Norman for your invitation. Such a pleasure to talk about such an important subject actually today and uh, think about sustainability through architecture, through uh, our role actually as citizens, as architects today. I would like to present uh, one project that we just delivered in France. It's the first low carbon energy positive building in France and it's an industrial building. So what we have in mind uh, for industrial buildings are always those metal thin uh, structures that are put in, on the fringes of what we call cities. And here the challenge uh, for me in the competition was how to, how to change our perception on uh, industrial buildings, but also can we actually achieve a low carbon energy positive building, so a very sustainable construction for such an energy uh, uh, needing actually structure. So it's a place for manufacturing, for making. It's in Normandy. And also the question is how nature exists within such structures. And the first exercise is maybe something that brings us back to form. Nirmal, you talked about it. It's about uh, designing a compact form. And form is here about bioclimatic, is how to really respond to the environment and how to think about a shape and in, in a compact uh, form, but also to respond to elements of nature that sometimes we forget in cities because we're faced with plots where we have you know, surrounding structures and we're actually trying to seek where's the south, where's the north, east or west. And how to place a program according to, uh, to the elements of, uh, of the environment. For example, in uh, such a structure where you need ateliers or workshops to, to work with the hand to manufacture, they are placed to the north, they take advantage of northern light, uh, you ventilate naturally the building and, and try to uh, like place it also in a natural and take advantage of the natural uh, setting where we're at. And what we find actually is that we are in a context uh, where there are lots of industries around and generally in these industries always exist in very pristine and natural environments. So the challenge is how do you bring beauty again in such context and really bring again a sense of architecture and transform such environments that generally are derelict outside of cities. 
So in, in such a place also, earth is very uh, uh, like a precious material and here we have the clay earth. So the idea was also to build with the earth of the site and manufacture the element of construction from the earth of the site. So basically brick making and because we have a clay-like um, like resource. So I decided let's, with my team, let's do this project with the earth and uh, build again with the uh, local brick makers, so artisanal make brick makers who are today working mainly in renovation and try to get again like a vernacular technique into uh, our knowledge today and use the technology of today to use bricks in construction. So we manufactured 550,000 bricks and we decided to build the whole project with bricks and here also the challenge was do we still know how to build with bricks? So how do we work with the uh, local brick makers and with the masons and form them again into masonry and brick making? Uh, the techniques today also uh, of calculation allowed us to really use minimal material. It was really an interesting uh, shift between calculating the arches uh, of this construction, but at the same time going almost to very uh, vernacular ways of constructing. For example, the facade of the uh, project that we drew was printed on the scale one to one, and the brick, ma like brick masons were using that to uh, construct the project. So there is a sense also where architecture becomes a tool to build knowledge and to reconnect between one another, but also in a way in construction somehow it becomes elements and you start to have to master and know every, uh, every material that you are using and measure its carbon footprint, go back to biosourced and geosourced materials. And in a way, in a place where uh, normally it's a cold place for making, it becomes more of a warm environment where all the materials become really uh, part of the, uh, uh, of the uh, like atmosphere of this interior space. So it's really made with very simple material like this uh, acoustic panels that are made out of uh, wooden fibers or like wood uh, like um, uh, frames uh, and trying like within the spaces to create like communication between uh, every uh, atelier and the other. And as we see here, like bringing natural light, reducing the need of artificial light and allowing this place to be a place where we can work with precision. So th this exercise really was interesting because it's, uh, we are really in an industrial zone. So the mayor was also surprised to see such a building that is an industrial building in, in that setting. But it also pushes one to think about our dialogue with nature. So here, for example, also all the outside of, the, uh, uh, of this uh, building and uh, all the landscaping was done with the earth, the excavation earth that we used. And then we uh, actually made all those uh, landscapes with, with the earth. So basically reducing the impact of moving the earth outside and the carbon footprint of moving the earth and then actually making all the landscape. And again, the landscape uh, grows with uh, all the uh, like, um, na natural species that are of the place. Uh, and also they are like these gardens become places where the uh, artisans meet, where they actually are encountering nature. So playing this notion also of inside outside where architecture and the built environment is able to, uh, to have nature inside of its precincts. All the frames that were used for the uh, arches were used again to make those benches that become places where everyone would uh, just sit and also places where uh, other like bees could exist and have their own houses. And then also with the lighting, how to light to the minimum and allowing uh, this place to be least uh, polluting in terms of its uh, lighting uh, design. Another like example uh, is uh, here, not necessarily with the construction material, because here it's a concrete structure. It's about thinking about our environment where we're building, like here it's a tower that is in Beirut. And the question here is how do you build a tower in a Mediterranean climate where it's not about a glass uh, building, again, that you need to climatize and uh, um, like spend a lot of energy to make it uh, sustain. 
explain and listen to sometimes vernacular ways of constructing. So it's a tower where the houses and the, the windows become more measured and listen to that, uh, to that Mediterranean climate. But it's also, again, having the hand and having the community as part of the making of architecture. So all the facade was handmade. It was hand chiseled with this comb that uh, we designed. And then we did this plaster that was made of earth as well. And the whole facade was combed by hand. And as we see here, also nature is part of the uh, framing of those windows as planters is also listening sometimes to how like, life exists in Mediterranean climates where we have uh, like the balconies full of nature and the pots, so really integrating that as part of architecture and allowing this uh, situation where we are part of um, like framing the city but also having uh, this like, natural environment growing up. So the architecture is somehow really negotiating with its environment, a lot, like trying to talk with its neighbors and trying to disappear at points also with its uh, context. And within the same context of Beirut and with Lebanon that is living constant uh, apocalypses and currently at the moment is also a sad uh, time for Beirut, we talk about light also and the absence of light and those are photos that were taken by Lorian Guinitiu just after the explosion in Beirut and with the scarcity of light. We were talking about that at lunchtime where you know you, you have places where you don't have light actually and access to light. So the question of uh, what is light actually and is light uh, an element of, um, uh, of need? Uh, can we talk about sustainability and light? And this is where we uh, recently published this book about light and, uh, and also thinking about light as, uh, as a means of uh, division between societies but also how, li how light could exist in very uh, sparse ways between uh, Beirut where you don't have light and Las Vegas where you can see uh, the city center from uh, 130 parks uh, in the US or around Las Vegas. But also the pollution that we are causing in uh, the universe and this is a photo of all the satellites and the airplanes <coughs> within, uh, within the um, a space and that are actually hindering our vision uh, of the actual space uh, realm around us. Or like this kind of uh, sparsity of light between uh, the city of Kuwait here and its surrounding or the light pollution that is uh, causing uh, and uh, like um, actually uh, dramas and uh, ecological uh, um, impacts on uh, the sea but also uh, beyond the cities themselves. And maybe in that case uh, togetherness and collaboration become extremely, expre extremely important and this is a photo of the Serpentine Pavilion uh, that was recently, uh, last year actually, uh, we did it uh, in London. And the point was really a moment of togetherness and a moment where uh, we have to get uh, into a consensus and it's about collaboration and different uh, intelligences actually to make a change. Thank you. So thank you, Elena, Norman, and thanks to the foundation. I want to tell you about um, three projects, and especially one starting with a collaboration between a client and an architect, Axiona and us. Um, it all starts with the aim to achieve a unique project, and looking at different areas of, of sustainability, but not just that, nature, construction, how to have a positive so, so social impact in the space. We also looked at mobility, energy demand, and production. The project is located in the southern part of Madrid, and it's a, it's a building from 1905, an industrial site at the peak of fossil fuel production of electricity in the area. It was an abandoned site that was transformed into a green campus 
breaking the barriers between the public and the, so and the private spaces. The project recycles 10,000 tons of brick. It creates 12, around yeah, 12,000 uh, uh, square meters of, of new landscape, and we planted 300 trees. It consumes 80% less water than the, your usual landscape design. It was a derelict plot that was transformed into a new garden. The vision from Norman, the protected building and the intervention, three slabs a step to allow daylight and natural ventilation into the space. And an old basement that's transformed into a new ground level and is connected to the, to the outside space, to the garden space. A courtyard that will bring people and the old car park space that becomes landscape. An abandoned building that traditionally might have been demolished. And here is an opportunity. The, the, the wood structure is made of chestnut. It's harvested in the north of Spain, and it was a collaboration between the client and the local industry, aiming to have circularity. Chestnut is traditionally used for furniture and producing structures. And here, we thought it could be both. It's a big piece of furniture that could be used. It's demountable. And we retrofitted the existing lifting bins, and it was an idea of the contractor to do this. That way, we could use less resources to bring in the materials and to assemble the elements. <coughs> it's demountable. But we also looked at ways to minimize the usage of materials, less suspended ceilings, just leave the structure raw. The client saw that as an opportunity, it's a unique real estate product. So that benefits into the dialogue with the architecture. We studied the building data and using a, a hybrid carbon footprint calculation and over a 60 year life cycle period, the building 25% uh, less embodied carbon. And that takes into account transport and operational. It is 40% more efficient in energy. But it was presented also at COP26. They asked for a case study because it achieved Paris Agreement uh, uh, targets. And they were also studying circularity. It is, in the end, one planet ecological footprint, meaning it only takes what the Earth can give to it. So if, if it's a building about urban improvement, and using Norman's words, if the uh, 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 biggest action in sustainability is to recycle existing structures, and Buddha does recycle, and, and it reuses, it regenerates the space, and it transforms. Now the building is occupied, 500 people, tech company, they want to bring in new talent. So the outdoor space, the courtyard that we discussed earlier, the shaded spaces with the landscape become gathering for social, also for working. The heat island effect here is avoided. It's a cooler space that can be used all year round. Luckily in Madrid, we, we can use this space even in the, in the heat of, of August with 40 degrees. But we noticed side effects. We, we saw something that was happening in the landscape and a study on biodiversity. We brought that in, we photographed the elements and we noticed uh, the results of the, the study shows that nature likes this place. And the building is actually flourishing. The second project I wanted to show you is uh, um, uh, visitor center facilities in the north of Spain. The similarities is the relationship between nature and the building. Here the nature is the vineyard and the structure is enlarged. A series of arches, an overhang, that protects the windows from the direct solar radiation. And that minimizes the usage of energy. The spaces emulate the, the industry of winery. So it's reflecting that tradition in a sense. And the protagonist is the landscape. You are inside and you're framing the vineyards. Using photovoltaics, and reducing the amount of 
um, energy consumed. Actually, the building provides energy to the surrounding buildings. The third case study is Le Dome, a winery production in Santa Emilion. <coughs> the site is protected by UNESCO, the landscape and the buildings. So the only way that we could actually have this building produced is because they consider it was part of the landscape. And that the way that you circulate around the building, you see the sloping element there, that's a ramp. That way you would always make the landscape the protagonist. The nature would be always your front view and the building would be at the back. It's a wooden structure again. In these three cases, wooden structures allow us to minimize the amount of materials for foundations, amount of water, amount of concrete. The usage of this space at the upper level is a facility where people work, they collaborate, there is marketing, but there are also events and gatherings. So there is the idea that we want to connect always to the outside. The span is 30 meters wide. We bring daylight similarities with Lina's pro project and about how wooden structures, circular structures, will bring daylight through the center. But that connectivity between the work that happens at the ground level with that the space to create an area for uh, taking advantage of thermal mass while the collaborative spaces above could happen. We did the science, we studied acoustics to see how that would complicate or not the effects of that. And they actually quite enjoy it. They, they want to see each other. They want to see how the marketing personnel and the clients that are coming in could see the harvest at the same time. The circular building is compact, so it reduces the amount of facade and it reduces the amount of materials. It is basically a, a passive uh, passive house type of building. The building, the response again from Heritage once that we completed, he congratulated because it has become part of the landscape and it's not really a building. Thank you. Okay, so uh, I hope you're getting ready with questions. I'll soon turn it on to you. I also want to acknowledge that we're running a little bit late. Uh, I apologize, I hope you can stay. I realize it's Madrid, so it's not yet dinner time, so I hope you can. Um, so wow again, right? I mean, what beautiful buildings, uh, amazing solutions. Uh, you know, there's so much knowledge and technology, even though you don't see it. It's performing in amazing ways and how you can also design with nature with such uh, incredible results. We had a also a, a conversation and, and one, one of the questions that, you know, often comes up, and so I want to get it just out there, is that um, all these buildings are extraordinary and sort of the knowledge that's coming with it is, is amazing and should make you think about possibilities. But they were done in a context of really quite rich clients and generous clients with imagination and ambition to create something unique. And there's a little bit of the question that always stucks with me that, uh, that asks, you know, oh, what about the rest of us? Can we uh, see this knowledge that's being created, these possibilities? And there seems maybe to be a gap between what can be done in a really special project versus how you know, more normal builders build and so on. So I know that you're particularly passionate about this because we talked about lunch. Uh, also, uh, maybe bringing up the context a little bit that you brought up with, with Lebanon and Beirut. So tell us a little bit about that. How do you see that gap and what do you think? Um, yeah, I, I mean, like, I think there is a first a preconception when you see a beautiful architecture, like sense in the, the question of beauty you know, in architecture. It's directly associated with a certain, uh, you know, elite client or rich uh, context, and I think this is a stigma about uh, 
the, the, the fact that we don't take care enough of our environment or we don't, like, we don't implement beauty enough in our daily life. And I think it's, um, if you look at the project in Beirut, uh, this is not a rich uh, client uh, mm -hmm. project. It's really a, a medium range project and it's a context where we are in Beirut. I mean, I, I grew up uh, studying in uh, the American University of Beirut and part of my studies I was also studying informal settlements. So it's about also negotiating uh, with such context and allowing a sense of identity and sense of like, like uh, belonging also to architect uh, of architecture to its uh, to its place. So how can architecture talk about the memory of the city? How can it also talk about that informal construction that is happening? Uh, if we're talking about the uh, industrial building, uh, the manufacture. Uh, of course, this is for Hermès, which is, I mean, they're well-off client, but at the same time, their industrial construction is very much limited in budget, generally, and generally, such constructions are never uh, put out in the public, and it was the first time we were proposing another kind of architecture with exactly the same limited budget, but just thinking about the resources of the place allows this kind of different approach to things rather than uh, doing the same recipes of what is an industrial architecture mm -hmm. or it's uh, the way it appears generally as um, uh, devoid of any care mm -hmm. or any thought of um, right. by architects. But great. So, uh, but there's a lot of territory there, I think, yeah. as these innovations and concepts can become used by more people as well. So, Pab, do you want to also respond to that? I mean, how do you see that gap? Um, I think we do take for granted, obviously, that some of these clients might be uh, wealthier. But we forget that there are limitations. And, and, and in the case of Ombu, actually, we got the budget very much limited, actually cut by half at some point. So I think that exercise really, and, and that is a, is a lesson that we learn constantly. We need to be responsible, first of all. The sustainability is not just about green spaces, it's about uh, resources uh, and all kinds, and and I think all these lessons on on finance it needs to be applied in every project. That, that way, responsible, whether it's in one location or another, I mean, you will always learn something there. But you could apply this knowledge, uh, uh, that luckily in bigger projects or or with wealthier, I suppose budgets, you could then take into other places, right? Anyway, I'm just getting all your architects yeah. thinking a little bit you're, about you're this. You're provoking us. Uh, I'm I mean, supposed you, you, you to, You mean right? like architects are elitist, I know it's like a, just an elitist, uh, you know, like... No, no, I, th I think you're creating like, wonderful like, solutions. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> but it, I think that question is, is a fair one. But anyway, but this is good. Um, so I have a, another provocative question, I'm afraid. Well, first I want to say one thing that I really appreciate about both your talks and yeah. this idea of redesign of spaces that used to have other functions, right? You know, just to continue to quote Jane Jacobs, she, another famous quote is that new ideas need old buildings, right? So there's this idea of, of spaces, you know, living new lives and enabling new things, mm -hmm. right? And I thought that was really, to me, it was a beautiful idea that was both in your presentations of, uh, of not really thinking of the building or even the built environment as an object, right? But thinking about as a process in time, a process that engages people, in your case, they're really straining people and maintaining culture of how to build in certain ways and so on, right? And so that, that's really a beautiful thing and opens up sort of the process of design to other dimensions as well. I know you're conscious of this, but I think yeah. it's particularly beautiful. I, I think yeah. because also the process of building is a long process. I mean, some projects, for example, the project of Beirut is a process of 10 years. Mm -hmm. Of course, it's not a continuous process, but mm -hmm. the time where we got the commission designing the project, then the project stops because of an economic Right. collapse in the city and then again you pick up the construction becomes a hole and and then it stops and then right. uh, so, so it is also uh, it's a, you know it's an accumulation of time where you exchange with so many different bodies with different uh, disciplines and uh, and you build knowledge through uh, the process of making and that's where actually it's not only about just building an object it's really a, a whole process mm -hmm. of making that uh, where time becomes really encapsulated in that physical environment that is manifested in a, a 
in a, in a context of a, of a neighborhood or um, uh, like a suburb or in a city. Yeah, I mean, yeah. building knowledge is something that we were talking about, but mm -hmm. we are one of the roles in the bigger table, right? Mm -hmm. and, and it is part of our job also to coordinate that knowledge and, and to have a sense of our speciality, which might be also uh, building or trying to make it beautiful, but also learning from all these other conversations. And in some cases, we just need to guide the conversation and, and play advocacy, I suppose, to be able to steer that. Uh, so it's, it's, it's more than making objects. Right. Yeah, which makes also our role even more uh, complex. We, we, you were talking about it in the prior uh, discussion. I mean, it's about both orchestrating uh, a whole discussion to have a clarity. You know, you, you have to speak a clear sentence at the end. It should make sense. And at the same time, taking on all the different parameters, which are many because our disciplines are becoming more and more specialized. And, mm -hmm. and uh, thankfully, because we can, I hope we can work more thoroughly with biology in the future to, you know, to develop our materials in a more bio-sourced bio and uh, um, in sync with uh, nature. But, but that brings on another complexity to our work as architects, which is fantastic. And, and the most successful projects is when you have a strong drive from somebody, a lead, yeah. or it could be a mayor, or it could be just a group that has a very clear mind. But sometimes you come across a situation that there is no real objective and we really should take a step forward and try to create that lead or at least find, you know, ask the right questions maybe sometimes and, and try to find that to create a success on, on that particular project. Great. So I have a question up my sleeve, but I think given the time, I'm going to open it up to the audience to see what you may have. So I think there are microphones that you could ask if you put your hand up perhaps or something. <laughs> Norman has a question. So. Surprise, surprise. <laughs> I guess he has prerogative. Um, in Please. the spirit of being provocative, I'd like to just comment on, I, I know exactly what Maria meant by saying you can't plan, but actually the extraordinary achievements that she showed are the result of planning. And if we take Chicago, your home city, it was Burnham, mm -hmm. the architect, who was commissioned by a group of businessmen and the plan adopted by government, which is responsible for the Chicago that you live in today. And the same is true of London. The master plan was conceived in the height of World War II, mm -hmm. created, reinforced the Green Belt, um, the concept of neighborhoods, which we all enjoy today. And I think in the line of being provocative, it's fashionable if somebody produces a beautiful building, like Lena showed us, to say, well, it's a rich client, it's MS, it's luxury. I tell you, <laughs> these people are tough. They're, <laughs> they're tough with money. And, tough. <laughs> and, and if I take Nirmal's point about the importance of form, um, then there's a diagram, and it's a bit difficult to describe a diagram in words, but it's a triangle. And if you talk about sustainability, the base of the triangle, the thin layer at the bottom, delivers the maximum sustainability for the minimum expenditure in terms of cost and energy. And that's the form. Mm -hmm. And it's no accident that Lena's building is highly economical. I mean, it's a big, compact form. It encloses the maximum volume with the minimum amount of external wall. So I just thought I'd pass those <laughs> reflections on. Thank That's you. great. Uh, I, I just re I'm not going to comment much, but just on Chicago, I have to. Uh, which, of course, is, that's the way we do it in Chicago. We got the visionary and the business people to kind of start it off. But I think, I, I think it begs the question of the limits to planning. Certainly the master plan, the, the block structure, and some of the features were done that way. And that opens up space for other kinds of design and life to also take place that are less planned. And I think it kind of art articulates what you said with what Maria is trying to say. So I think we should not take, you can never not plan anything, which is an extreme position, and it's not true, but also that 
you know, the Burnham plan is not exactly what happened in Chicago. It happened, obviously, to the built environment in a certain sense, but not fully, right? Allowed things to happen. Isn't it that you need the discipline, whether it's a grid like the Manhattan right. grid, that allows spontaneity, spontaneity exactly. and, and the accidental, the unplanned, apparently, to appear within it? That's right. So I think that this is an important lesson, right? You need both in a certain sense but you never know exactly how. So questions from the audience. It's, uh, it's time to hear your voice a bit. Sorry, I can't quite see. It's very bright for me, so I cannot call them. Yes. Did you, did you have something to say? Oh. <laughs> Feeding back. By Eisenhower, <coughs> who once said, okay, oh, it doesn't work, okay. So I didn't, want to, I didn't want to ask something, just wanted to add a quote by Eisenhower, who once said that planning is indispensable, but plans are worth it. Plan? Having a plan. We're not going anywhere without a plan but you need to be flexible enough and you need to realize that plans are worthless. In the end, other things will happen than what you planned, but if you didn't have a plan, you wouldn't be getting there. That's a paradox. Uh, but I really mean it. I want to a question from the audience, not the speakers, please. <laughs> we all just talk too much, as you can see. Um, a kind, uh, there's one there in the back, perhaps? Um, okay, so all of the examples you've given, or most of them, were normally in big cities, especially with a climate that does uh, accept that vegetation, that nature. I know it's autochthonous, I know Madrid is a bit dry, but for example, if you were to do a sustainable city in a desert, in a, let's say, a dry climate that's very hard, on nature, where nature is nothing, like Arizona, um, Dubai, how would we make that more sustainable? Because we're seeing mega projects that use a lot of money, and um, they're just not that sustainable. <laughs> <laughs> well, Norman wants to Norma answer. Has so. the, Norma has the answer. Should we have maybe one more question from the audience to make sure we get them in? And then Norman will reply. Yeah. And I also want to reply. But, yeah. um, no, no, okay. No, no. I just want to make sure we get. Uh, is there another question? There's one here, I think. Sorry. So I'm just trying. Yes, uh, thank you for the great presentations. Earlier it was said that leadership, especially on the mayoral level, is very important for innovative cities. My question is this, where does the voice of the people fill in and how does that inform political leadership and boost it when it's not otherwise there? Okay. Now you run away with it, yeah, that comes. I can't help it, I'd love to comment. Um, I think that if I take the, um, our work on master planning for Kharkiv in the Ukraine, it's a bottom-up approach. So it's through questionnaires, it's through citizens' groups. It's the same approach as the Foundation did on an informal settlement in Odisha. It, you identify the important groups in that case, it was the fishermen, the businessmen, and the women, three separate groups. And their preferences informed the priorities which generated the master plan. Um, so that's the opposite of imposing it from the top. It's a community involvement. And coming back to the issue of how do you do something sustainable in a desert environment, I can talk from first-hand experience on a series of experiments called Mazdar. And what you do is you start off with buildings that were built before an age of cheap energy, before you could throw a switch, have refrigeration, electric lighting, cooling, heating. Uh, you learn from that architecture. It's about orientation, it's about thermal mass, 
It's about evaporative cooling of water, vegetation, uh, wind towers that capture cool breezes which are above the desert floor, uh, bringing stuff from below the desert floor where it's quite cool. You learn all those lessons and then you apply the technology of solar. And you have, in the case of Mazda, something which is totally solar powered and highly energy uh, intensive, 24 hours, seven days. It's a laboratory uh, complex uh, and it's solar powered. Now, the principles there would be universal, but of course, in the, the reality in, say, a Siberian climate would be very different. You'd be encouraging the sun. You wouldn't be creating shade. So sun's the enemy in the desert. Uh, the sun is the friend in Siberia. Great. Does anyone want to yeah, answer? I mean, yeah. just to echo uh, what Norman's saying, actually, uh, we're doing the uh, Contemporary Art Museum in... Uh, we're doing the Contemporary Art Museum in Alula in uh, Saudi Arabia. And this is the first thing that one's experience is we, you go to the old city that was built all with mud and you just walk between all those earthen walls and suddenly you're like 10 degrees less than the outside. So you just start learning, your body learns actually how you can build more in tune with, the, uh, with nature, with the climate there. And it's about reviving again those techniques of construction, those dimensions, those forms that actually transform completely uh, your, uh, the temperature and allow you to cope with such a weather. And, and this is where we are lucky today that we have the techniques, we have the means, we have the technology to, to build with such a material, but while with the knowledge of today and, of course, all the sophistication of the calculations that you need. Mm -hmm. Do you want to reply to that as well? I wanted to reply on, on leadership, um, actually. Um, and I wanted to say that if, if we think of complex systems today and think of leadership, then it doesn't mean necessarily top-down leadership. It means vertical leadership, but it also means horizontal leadership. So it means leadership also amongst peers. Um, and leadership actually always has a momentum where you decide to do something without asking everybody. But the next step is, of course, that you need to involve <coughs> Um, so I, I hope that's, that this provides an answer because given how cities function, I think you need visionary leadership and it then needs to be collaborative leadership. So you start planning in a way top down, you plan at the same time bottom up involving everybody and you just hope that you will meet each other somewhere in the middle. Yeah, I yeah. I, I think the, the, the question of leadership in, in Singapore in particular, um, which has a, a reputation for being top-down, <laughs> um, I, I think it's a, it's a, it's a, it does begin top-down in Singapore, but nothing would succeed if there wasn't also consensus, if there wasn't also some kind of agreement with what's being done. And so, to elaborate on what uh, Maria was saying, that you begin top down, but then you do solicit opinions. You do engage the public, because without that, uh, nothing would actually work. You would constantly getting resistance from the bottom. So it, I think there are different models of where leadership comes from. Um, it can be highly decentralized, or it can be highly authoritarian, but also a combination of the two. Yeah. Okay, so I think I'm getting the sign that we're more or less at the end of time. So I recognize that. Uh, I just want to say uh, a word is as, you, as we got to the end, you experienced where we are. It's in some sense the journey of discovery, of trying to understand what the new challenges, well, the, the new in, in the sense of intentionality, of sustainability, uh, asking of us whatever our, our uh, profession is, whether we're architects or decision makers or scientists or just citizens. And in some sense, it demands that we design and that we consider and that we work for life with life, both social life, of course, and uh, life in nature. And that, in some sense, is the greatest challenge of them all, but it's also 
maybe the greatest, most joyful activity that I think we can contemplate as designers work you know, with the greatest uh, designer on Earth evolution. So with that, stay in touch. For all of you who could not get in today, uh, we apologize again. We hope that will be a bigger venue in the future. And I hope you stay engaged and you benefit from, oh, Norman wants to say something? Yeah. So, last word. I, just, I don't need a microphone. <laughs> I'd just like to thank Rolex for making this kind of debate and the whole series continue. Just express our gratitude for your support. Well, thank, you. thank you. for being here to exchange your ideas, your thoughts, your inspiration. And we really hope that these debates will help you build a, a better future. Thank you very much. I hate. Thank you. Good. Stay engaged. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Ah. I did thank Rolex, didn't I? I did. I did. Briefly. You did. I did. No, no, you're not supposed to. I was, 